Um, to get us started, I want to introduce our opening panel, Racial Equity Through Civic Leadership and Community Organizing, moderated by Professor Bilal Dabir Seku. Professor Seku will share information about the structure of this panel and introduce our distinguished panelists. I am now privileged uh, to introduce a good friend and an outstanding scholar, speaker, author, and panel moderator, Dr. Bilal Seku. Bilal Dabir Seku is an associate professor of political science in Hillier College at the University of Hartford. His research interests are race and politics, urban politics and campaigns, elections, and voting behavior. Professor Seku has published articles on social and political participation by African Americans and public attitudes towards quality and integrated education in Connecticut. Over the years, he has served on the boards of directors for a number of organizations working on democracy reforms and racial and economic justice. These include Northeast Action, Democracy Works, Connecticut Cities and Action Group, the Connecticut Center for a New Economy, and One Connecticut. He currently serves on the board of directors for the Connecticut Mirror and Open Communities Alliance. He is also the chair of the board of directors of Common Cause in Connecticut and a member of that organization's national governing board. Professor Seku has also been a panelist and moderator at numerous events, including the Connecticut Civic Health Project's town hall meetings, Hartford Votes Voter Coalition candidate forum events, and major conferences. He's a very busy man. He also teaches a full uh, course load at the University of Hartford. I am very honored to welcome. Professor Bilal Seku, who will introduce Bilal. Thanks a lot, Val. I um, hardly recognize that guy as you were reading about him. So, <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for all of that fluff you put in there that make me look really good. So, um, you know, I, I'm really excited about being here today and being a part of this conversation. I want to thank Everyday Democracy for inviting me to be a part of these kinds of um, events and in particular to thank you know, Val and Zoya for the hard work that they put in um, to sort of pull this together and, and, and get us engaged. I'm really looking forward to hearing our three speakers today. And I, I want to sort of talk very briefly because they are the stars of this, uh, of this moment. We're beginning this day by having a conversation uh, with three outstanding civic leaders who are working, in my mind at least, on some of the most important and most challenging issues affecting communities across Connecticut, especially in our urban communities. And while this will be an important conversation about campaigns to move this work in different issue areas, I think it's important that we all be cognizant of how each speaker's work is actually connected to the work of the other speaker. And so if we really, truly want to work for the betterment of our state and our nation, I think it's important for us to think about how these issues really intersect. The reality is that to the extent that affordable housing is built, it's often built in areas with high crime rates, health disparities, failing schools, and joblessness. And I think it's really difficult to solve any of these problems if we try to tackle them alone and not see how they, are inter inter how they intersect. So I'm excited to hear these civic ambassadors who live in my mind, the civic ambassador pledge. These are folks who actually engage in action to improve the community. They carry forth the message that civic participation is a transformative experience. They engage in endeavors that actually work to strengthen Connecticut civic health. And so now we get an opportunity for them to share their civic action work. So let me introduce the three speakers we have. The first one is Robbie Hill. Robbie is a Yale undergraduate who volunteers as a community organizer with Desegregate Connecticut, an organization founded by Sarah Bronin in the midst of the Black Lives Matter protests last Ju June, 2020. Robbie works with other activists and organizers to correct decades of discriminatory housing policy through a series of statewide zoning reforms in Connecticut. Michelle Stewart Copes, a resident of New Hard Hitting, New Britain, Connecticut, is the CEO of SEET Consultants LLC Systems for Education, Equity, and Transition, 
and a national consultant and trainer in system of care and cultural and linguistic competency coaching. She developed and managed the nation's first and highly successful wraparound effort within an inner city area focused on Puerto Rican and African-American neighbors in Hartford, Connecticut. And our third speaker will be Melvin J. Medina, served as the, policy, the public policy and advocacy director for the ACLU of Connecticut between January 2014 until February 2021. There he led the organization's effort to create and maintain community engagement through education, member attainment, and general outreach. A proud Puerto Rican and resident of Waterbury, Connecticut, Melvin is passionate and knowledgeable about the issues that affect disadvantaged communities in the state. So again, I'm really looking excited. I'm really excited to hear from these speakers. And so why don't we uh, have them speak in the order that I introduced them? So why don't we start with Robbie Hill first? I thank you, Bilal, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm not sure you know, what my time allotment looks like, but if I have a little bit, I would love to share a few slides that talk about the work that we do at Desegregate Connecticut. Um, so I can do that. Probably about Everyone 10 minutes, so. 10 minutes, perfect. Yeah. Everyone should be able to see. Uh, Desegregate Connecticut, in short, we're a research advocacy and lobbying coalition, as Bilal said, founded by Professor Sarah Bronin of UConn. And we consist of almost 70 different organizations across the state and across the country. Uh, and through them, we draft legislation and we refine proposals. And then we bring those to legislators and we lobby legislators and we engage with community members. We meet them generally where they are by going to community events and by speaking on local panels and webinars. And we also host our own events to talk about our proposals. Uh, and we've had over 2000 attendees at those. These are some of the groups uh, that, that I work with as partnerships coordinator, housing advocates like Partnership for Strong Communities, statewide groups like the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities, uh, groups like the Connecticut Hispanic Democratic Caucus and Fairfield County Center for Housing Opportunities, CT Voices for Children, the Urban League, all groups committed to social justice and ones who have signed off on desegregate CT's proposals and who are committed to uh, prevent ending, eventually ending Connecticut's housing segregation through zoning reform first. A bit of background, uh, any of you who've read The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein, it's a, a recently popularized novel, know that throughout the 20th century, the government created and maintained residential segregation through a series of explicitly racist policies um, like redlining, which is on the cover of the color of law or racial covenants that barred black people from entrance into white suburbs. Uh, and as a result, black people lost out on decades of, uh, of access to the suburbs, which for white middle class families is the primary means through which they acquire wealth is in the appreciation of uh, their home's equity. These policies were outlawed uh, finally with 1968 with the passage of the Fair Housing Act but in their place, towns have used something called exclusionary zoning to keep their communities segregated and to maintain their resources. Exclusionary zoning is a series of uh, intentional land use practices that are designed to limit housing supply and to drive up housing prices. Um, this usually involves blocking certain types of housing like multifamily housing or duplexes or triplexes, types of housing that are naturally more affordable by virtue of their size, and also by setting unreasonably high standards for development. This could be excessive minimum lot size requirements. Sometimes in Connecticut, you see upwards of one, two, three, even four acres just for a single family home in a town, or it could be excessive minimum parking requirements. Uh, some towns mandate that each single family home have four off street parking spaces. These are all factors that contribute to price increase uh, and eventually get passed down to home buyers and renters. There's a very easy uh, way to understand exclusionary zoning, and that's that when you drive up home prices, you're driving out poor and middle income people from your communities. And as a result, wealthy towns are able to hoard resources like public education, parks, and stores uh, from Black people and Hispanic people disproportionately who are less wealthy as a result, as a direct result of decades of explicitly racist housing policy in the 20th century. In Connecticut, we have it even worse as a state than most places across the country. Uh, the Bridgeport, Stanford, New Haven, and Hartford metro areas have the highest increases in income segregation since 1970, 
Fairfield County in the southwestern corridor is the most income segregated place in the country, and 70% of Connecticut's black population lives in just 17 different municipalities out of 169. Uh, by pretty much every metric, any researcher worth their snuff estimates that Connecticut is one of the most segregated places in the country. And so it's out of this uh, urgent need for action that desegregate CT emerged. And we identify three principal justifications for zoning reform. And that's to increase our community's equity, to improve our state's economy, and to protect our state's environment. But today, I'm going to focus specifically on that first reason, and that's equity. So first, I think we have to identify part of the problem, and that's that Connecticut has a severe lack of housing diversity. Uh, the image you're seeing is from the Desegregate Connecticut Zoning Atlas, where we actually mapped every single zoning code uh, in the state of Connecticut to see what types of housing it allowed and with what requirements. And we found that 90.5% of all zoned land in the state allows single family housing as of right. And that means without a special permit or review process. Contra uh, contrast that with where multifamily housing is allowed and the, the difference is incredibly stark. Uh, the purple is where multifamily housing is allowed as it was for the single family. And this is true in only 2.2% of land. Uh, and it's almost exclusively concentrated in our cities of Hartford and New Haven, Bridgeport, Stamford, Waterbury. Uh, and so that means then that certain classes of people, typically black people and Hispanic people and, and always poor people are confined into urban centers that lack the sort of resources to contribute to community success. So we have a problem uh, that Connecticut isn't producing enough housing. And that again stems from our zoning codes. We are not allowing higher density housing. We're, we're putting too many barriers in place to good development. So that's the problem that desegregate CT identified is that it's too limited and too homogenous. And as a result, we have a series of inequitable outcomes. Educational access, for instance, in Fairfield County, it's 3.5 times more expensive to live in a town with a high performing school district than one with a low performing one. Again, public education is foundational uh, to the success of our children and to our communities. And by shutting out poor and middle income people from certain towns, we're also shutting them out from better schools. Uh, public health, which I know we will address on this panel, there is almost a 16 year difference in life expectancy between Northeast Hartford, which is a poor community with a high uh, high density housing and West Hartford Center, which is a single family exclusive area. Um, these, these discrepancies are true throughout the state and often they're even true within a city. Where I live in New Haven, there is a 10 year difference in life expectancy between two adjacent neighborhoods. Uh, and that largely has to do with a long history of racist housing policy and zoning policies that have failed to correct that. And lastly, cost burdening. Uh, housing cost burdening refers to spending 30% or more of your income on housing. And Black and Hispanic people across Connecticut have higher rates of cost burdening, and especially Black and Hispanic women. As I just discussed, uh, the, the public health dis discrepancy between New Hallville and Prospect Hill and New Haven, uh, you can see that there's a difference in the diversity of housing that's allowed. There's also differences in uh, demographics between the two areas. New Hallville, where there is uh, more multifamily housing, is almost 90% black and less than 1% white. Prospect Hill, which is a richer area, is 35% white and 25% black. And Prospect Hill has a greater than 10 year average life expectancy compared to New Hallville. Sorry, educational inequity, as I was discussing before, the top, the 10 towns with the highest performing school districts are severely overrepresented in terms of their white population and underrepresented in their black and Hispanic population compared to Connecticut averages. And that is because we are concentrating poor people who again are disproportionately black and Hispanic in our urban centers and not permitting them access to suburbs with good schools. So we need more housing and more variety, especially in our suburbs that have closed off and excluded access for, for decades. And that's where desegregate CT came in and we put forward a series of proposals that are now encapsulated in Senate Bill 1024, which is headed to the Senate floor. It was recently uh, received an OLR report. Uh, and in that bill, we talked about things like passing accessory dwelling units, which are uh, either attached or detached uh, housing units that are secondary to a single family dwelling. We talked about eliminating the word character from public review processes because that word has a long history or long racist connotation 
and is often used to keep people out because of the character of the people and not because of the architectural character of the neighborhood. And we talked about reducing parking mandates to help drive down prices in, uh, in neighborhoods across the state. And we're lucky then that there's starting to be much greater recognition for these issues. President Biden has made inclusionary zoning and not exclusionary zoning a, a priority in his infrastructure plan. And in publications across the country, we're seeing greater recognition. We're also seeing that in the state uh, where 71% of people who spoke at the public hearing for SB 1024, the desegregated CT legislation, spoke in favor, including 100% of young people and then again, over 40 op-eds written in local publications in support of our platform. So this is where I'll end and ask for your help, right? As, as members of our community, as people who are engaged and start by saying that if you text zoning to 313131, that will allow you to follow up with Desegregate CT's progress and it will give you information about our bill and about ways that you can help. And the biggest ways that you can help are by meeting with legislators, which again, we make easy on our website at desegregatect.org slash take action. And again, by contacting Governor Lamont's office. Uh, he's vowed to take on housing segregation and he has to have the, the backing and the political will to do it. And that's where we step in to make sure that they hear us. Other ideas, you can write op-eds or letters to the editors. You can organize rallies. You can publicize desegregated CT's work on social media. Uh, and again, I'll reiterate, please go to our website, desegregatect.org slash take action and absolutely text zoning to 313131. Thank you. Wow, thanks a lot, uh, Robbie. Great presentation, um, you know, very straightforward. Really appreciate that work. Um, why don't we go to our next speaker, which will be Michelle. Uh, thank you to embrace the full impact of health disparities. I think we should first appreciate the definition of health from the World Health Association. And that is the state of complete physical, mental, social, and spiritual well-being. So that's what health equity would look like. And any negative experience in any one of these areas will impact our overall health. So I'm so glad, Bilal, that you've emphasized that we must consider the intersectionality of economic inequalities, housing inequalities, social inequalities, and racial inequalities to really understand the impact, the powerful impact of health inequalities. So I want us all to join the US YWCA who on Thursday in a webinar sounded the alarm on our current condition and named racism as a public health crisis. Currently, people of color are three times more likely to get COVID-19 and two times more likely to die. And that's because of the pre-existing conditions that we have resulting from structural racism and the social determinants of health. And we named a lot of them already, the racist redlining and zoning policies, living in crowded, dilapidated housing, not able to social distance, breathing in mold and toxic air, you know, the asthma that we all have, the scarce access to quality health care and healthy food. 25% of African Americans are not insured and living within poverty guidelines. And there's a lack of vaccination guidelines, vaccination sites and primary care in impoverished areas. Dr. Aletha Maybach, who is the vice president of the American Medical Association, named racism as a public health crisis back in April of last year. She talked about the stress hormone cortisol and how it raised havoc in destroying our internal organs and it lowers our white blood cell count, which is the reason why people of color die more and faster from the five chronic diseases, cancer, asthma, hypertension, heart disease, and diabetes. 
our black babies die more than any other babies in this country. And we have a higher mort infant mortality rate than a lot of third world countries. Black women also die more in childbirth and there's increasing evidence of maltreatment. This maltreatment goes back to slavery goes back to 1619. You all remember the CDC, Center for Disease Control Experiment with the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, which spanned it over 40 years from 1932 to 1972 with 600 black men. And they went with untreated syphilis because they just wanted to observe the painful symptoms and the results over that period of time where there were 28 to 100 deaths and syphilis passed down to 19 of children. And Bill Clinton only apologized in 1997 because of that. We also are aware of how one third of the female population in Puerto Rico were sterilized. Uh, birth control was tested without consent. That was from 1930 to 1970. And this was all merely to look at the reduction of poverty and unemployment. We go back to looking at, you know, why are people dying faster, people of color faster and more so than whites. Back to uh, the AIDS epidemic, Margaret Heckler uh, with the Department of Health and Human Services did a minority report at that time, which is the reason why the Office of Minority Health was established in 1986. Congress commissioned the Institute of Medicine to do a study of health disparities to really find out why we had so much health disparities and so much more deaths with people of color. So over a hundred studies were done and they were valid studies, you know, because they controlled for race, income, age, and insurance and insurance. So they saw and found and proved that implicit bias, prejudice, and discrimination in, health, in healthcare was the cause and results of all of these health inequities. You can see this in the book, Unequal Treatment. And now, that was written back in 2003, but now every two years, the National Healthcare Quality and Disparities Report is written and studied that comes out of the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality and is still proven prevalent and consistent that we have disparities in healthcare. When we saw the webinar with the USYWCA, we heard from Faith Crittenden, who is a pediatric resident at Yale New Haven Health, and she reported currently that she saw over 100 citations for health disparities related to racism. And on that same webinar, there was Nicole Austin Hillary, Executive Director with Human Health Watch. And she was looking at water rights. And she was looking at Detroit, where there were families where they cut off the water, where there was a higher incident of incidents of COVID-19. So all of this confirms and exacerbates recent studies from the CDC to spotlight how racial ethnic disparities in recent COVID-19 hospitalizations and visits are still occurring. What was really troubling to me, I had saw a presentation by Dr. Linda Berry from UConn, and she showed a physician that was a female physician that was given testimony and how she was treated badly, sent home twice regarding her COVID-19 symptoms. And she eventually died because her symptoms were overlooked, underestimated and ignored. So we must stop, address and eliminate these disparities and consider this an urgent crisis right now. We must act right now before we lose hundreds of more lives. Martin Luther King said that out of all the forms of inequality, 
injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and it's the most inhumane. So we must all work to demand equity. I appreciate your time and I appreciate your advocacy. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Wow. Um, two very, very good uh, opening presentations. Uh, Melvin, the pressure is on right now. Yeah. For you are next. <laughs> All right. I got to follow that up. <laughs> I'm looking forward to hearing this. <laughs> um, hey, folks. Uh, um, everyone calls me Mel. Feel free to call me Mel. Um, I'm happy to be with you all. Uh, today, um, a bit of background uh, for me. I'm a community organizer working at the ACLU. Uh, my undergrad is in history. And what I learned early on uh, in my undergraduate studies and since later in my adult life is how important uh, for people of color to know our history because our history is often oral and less written down. And so what I really wanna start with um, is a conversation about mass incarceration in Connecticut and what that history is. Uh, because as we talk about solutions, especially when we're talking about equity, so much of those solutions need to be informed by the history of how we got here. And so uh, I'll, I'll pick up on what was mentioned, particularly Robbie talking about uh, housing segregation. Um, in the 1960s, Connecticut was facing a variety of issues, housing segregation among them. Uh, but really what we were seeing happening in, in Connecticut between the 1940s and the 1960s was the phenomenon of white flight, uh, encouraged by federal funding that built highways that destroyed uh, pr predominantly Black and Puerto Rican neighborhoods in Hartford, New Haven, et cetera. Uh, the dispersion of jobs that left cities and went to suburbs as America as a whole was being, uh, um, uh, there was a suburban, suburbanization happening. Um, and also, obviously, as we all know, through the civil rights movement, an increase in racism and, and racial tensions uh, resulting in not just organizing, but riots, uh, famous riots in Hartford, uh, because of the conditions that people were living in. And, and I think that what, that what that means is the beginning of the mass incarceration story in Connecticut had three primary problems that were its foundation. Divestment of cities and growing inequality as a result of racist policies. Uh, you had a public health crisis that was being, uh, that was on, on, the, on, on, a, on a rise. In 1969, uh, then State Health Commissioner Franklin Foote, uh, in a, a meeting uh, uh, at the state legislature, announced that there had been a drug addiction epidemic in Connecticut. And that's really important because that date, 1969, is going to relate to a date that I later referenced in 1994. But in 1969, uh, what we knew about the drug addiction epidemic uh, is that 72% uh, in that same meeting, uh, state police presented a report. Uh, they had just uh, modernized their computer system. We were able to actually uh, give data on all arrests statewide. In 1969, when we had a, a, a rising uh, drug addiction epidemic, what we knew is that 72% of the arrests of people who were selling drugs in Connecticut were white men. What we also knew was that 73% uh, of, uh, of all drug arrests related to possession were white men. We knew that the majority of, uh, the, majority of, uh, uh, of, of the type of arrests that people were getting arrested for was heroin and not marijuana. That was 1969. In 1971, uh, uh, then President Richard Nixon declares a, a war on drugs that we're all familiar with launching a multiple decades of a war on drugs that really has decimated Puerto Rican, uh, uh, Latin, Latinx in general, and Black communities uh, as the focus, the central target of enforcement. We saw that early on in Connecticut. By 1972, the large majority of, of drug enforcement uh, was happening in our cities to the point that the percentages started to flip. So of arrests and uh, of both selling and, and possession in Hartford, for example, 72% of the arrests were uh, black men or Latinx men. So the, it, the results were almost instantaneous. Now, mind you, like federal housing policy, like highway policy, the drug war was informed and, uh, and uh, funded through federal dollars that increased our policing infrastructure uh, in terms of tactics, SWAT teams, drug narcotic teams, all that stuff. And it's important to note that 
the so that's that's looming problem one is like this big mistake we have a we have a, a drug addiction issue that is a really a public health crisis that we determine is now a criminal justice issue and then we have a third problem in connecticut which is by the 1960s connecticut prisons were already already overcrowding now there wasn't many people in prisons there was about 3,000 people at the time but all of connecticut's facilities were old and dated prior to the prior century what ended up happening between 1969 in 1980 is the further escalation of a drug war that incarcerates Black men and Puerto Rican men in particular. Uh, one, it, one very interesting fact for those of you who have studied Puerto Rican migration is that many Puerto Ricans had actually, uh, when they migrated to New York, had then left New York to come to Connecticut, primarily because New York in the 1980s was, high, was for many people feeling very dangerous. What they did not know actually is that Connecticut had a higher incarceration rate of Puerto Rican men than, it, than New York did. Um, now, what we find happening between uh, the 1970s and the 1980s is the general up, uh, uptick in drug arrests and, and, and drug enforcement. But what happens in the 1980s is a twofold problem. Connecticut prisons are overcrowding, Connecticut's getting sued, the conditions are terrible. Uh, and at the same time, the legislature starts to make choices about prevalent crime. And now all of you all are familiar with how we've uh, treated a drug use differently. If you used crack, it was a, uh, an entirely different sentencing disparity than if you used cocaine, for example. The focus on marijuana use, that despite the fact that it's uh, more prevalent among Black and Latinx communities than it is in white communities who often were using harder drugs, is another example. But what we, what we found is that the state legislature started making decisions like shifting from a determinate to indeterminate sentencing structure, truth in sentencing laws by the 1980s, uh, stricter parole uh, 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 requirements so that you had complete uh, in, you know 60% of your sentence and so forth. And what we see happening in the 1980s is not only a prison overcrowding problem, but that we're holding more people in Connecticut prisons for longer. And if in 1968, what we saw was the majority of people largely were white in Connecticut prisons. By 1982, we set what would become a historic and almost permanent uh, disparity in our prisons, where 70 plus percent of the people in Connecticut prisons were either Black or Latinx. That's a switch in the 20 years that then is embedded and entrenched even to this day, even though we've gone through 10 years of decarceration. Now, the prison overcrowding crisis, in addition to the drug war, creates a problem for lawmakers who are trying to figure out uh, how do we solve primarily the prison overcrowding cr uh, crisis. And what they decided to do is invest more in policing and invest more in prisons. And so by the 19, late 1980s and into the 1990s, Connecticut launches one of the most expensive prison, prison uh, expansion projects over a billion dollars. And that's not even including the uh, the yearly budget of the Department of Corrections that costs over $400 million. Um, but they expand Connecticut prisons at the same time that our incarceration rate in the 1990s is now exceeding New York's. And in fact, uh, since the 19, 1975, Connecticut incarceration rates have always uh, led within New England states. We have a history of incarcerating more people uh, by percentage, uh, by proportion than, for example, Massachusetts, Vermont, and so forth. And so by the 1990s, we're in a moment of the Clinton crime bill, truth and sentencing laws that are predominantly impacting Black and Latinx communities. And the violence that those laws are trying to solve are really rooted in a, a poorly, a poor decision back dating back to the 1960s of, uh, of, of tackling a, uh, a drug addiction problem as a war on drugs that was exacerbated by a, a multi-billion dollar investment in our policing, prosecutor, and criminal justice system. And so as we begin thinking about uh, equity in terms of how are these issues interrelated, as Robbie mentioned, uh, uh, Connecticut housing uh, uh, zoning laws essentially trapped people in cities the very same cities that were divested of and same very cities that did not benefit from economic policies that essentially were encouraging suburban, sub the suburbanization of Connecticut. These are the same cities that are facing drug addiction issues that are not being handled like a public health crisis, like we're now talking about in, in regards to the opioid crisis. But instead, we decided that we were going to use police 
in the criminal justice system to solve ultimately was uh, what are addiction issues. Um, and then the prison overcrowding uh, concern that is kind of like this third layer in which the solution becomes a deeper and increased investment in more prisons uh, that ultimately aren't solving these issues. And so as we begin this dialogue about where we go next, the important aspect to remember is that everything about mass incarceration in Connecticut is racialized. It was racialized at its inception. It is racialized today. And in 1994, uh, to give you an example, uh, this is now, uh, in 1994, then, um, then the State Commissioner of Health, uh, um, sorry, uh, uh, Sher Hosoko, uh, uh, declared that Connecticut's last multi-decade multi uh, uh, drug policy had, was, was a complete failure, and that, in fact, it was a field of nightmares that led to more policing, more prosecutors, and more prisons, and that we ultimately failed in our, in, our, in our goal of ridding Connecticut of any addiction issues related to drugs. And so I think that's like a prep uh, of, of a future conversation that we can all have about how are these is issues interrelated and where does Connecticut go next? But I think that that, that critical history of understanding how we got here is, I think, step one uh, as we continue this dialogue. Wow, so the uh, the three of you hit it out of the ballpark, as they say. Um, very, very good opening um, comments from, from each of you. I guess what I'd like to try to do now is to put you um, in dialogue with each other um, and to try to perhaps deepen some of the, you know, go into a deeper sort of discussion of some of the points that you made, but to, to see how they're sort of connected. So let me sort of start off and I'll, I'll do this by pairing you. And so I wanna actually start with Michelle and Robbie with the, uh, the first question. And of course, Mel, feel free to jump in after they sort of talk about, um, you know, my, or at least respond to my question. So, um, so we talked a lot about the long history of, of housing discrimination what Robbie talked about. And obviously we've talked a lot about public health and health equity. So I wanna see how these two sort of relate. So we've got this long history of housing discrimination and restrictive zoning, right? Which has created disparities in public health and educational outcomes. Talk more about how that has happened. And why don't we first start with Michelle and then Robbie, you answer second. So Michelle, sort of talk about how these are, are connected, these two issues. Well, what I get really upset about when I think about public health, you know, I think about historically, but I also think about now when I live in New Britain, I do a lot of work in New Britain and also in Hartford, and I just see how people are living. You know, I talked about breathing in the mold and asthma. And if you look at the stats, um, children and adults are two and three times more likely to go to the emergency room to deal with their asthma, which is just so awful. But that's just because of the lack of primary care, the lack of education or our preventative health, the lack of being able to live the way we should be living in equity and just living with roaches, rats and mold and just not being healthy and not being able to safely, you know, social distance with COVID-19 and then not to have our rights to live as equal American citizens. It makes me angry, but it's because of historic zoning laws and the lack of adequate housing. Yeah, I would reiterate everything Michelle said and, and say that I think when we're talking about public health and community health, we have to look beyond factors just like wealth. There are a number of different contributors to public health, like access to nutritious food, uh, air quality, access to adequate housing, uh, education within schools, mental health counseling. Um, and these are all resources that people growing up in segregated, urban, economically deprived areas are denied that contribute to things like lower life expectancy. Um, children in segregated urban areas have higher rates of asthma and respiratory disease. Uh, they lack access to public transportation and to green space. A very insightful article uh, that was published in the Washington Post this past summer found that previously redlined communities within cities are at least almost often eight degrees Fahrenheit hotter on average in the summer 
because those communities were not planned to have green space like trees and parks that reduce community temperatures. And those are actual quantifiable numbers of deaths that occur because of heat stroke and health complications. Um, and again, Michelle talked about housing conditions themselves. There are higher rates of vermin infestation, radon exposure, noise pollution, all in the communities that for, sent for decades have suffered from blight and disinvestment. Um, and, and so I think when we're talking about remedying uh, public health, bringing average life expectancy in line and averaging it across racial groups and across ethnic groups, we have to talk about taking a multimodal integra integrative approach to public health. It cannot start and end with uh, availability of uh, healthcare or of you know, food deserts. It has to start with where we live and with how we live. Can I just in, in, invite Michelle, you know, on this particular question to maybe dive a, a little bit deeper also around the educational impacts, because I know this is an issue you care a great deal about. The educational impact is, is so very, very important. Uh, we were doing a comparison um, in looking at Farmington, you know, versus New Britain and Hartford, and there's the graduation rate is so much higher in suburban areas. And you wonder why, well, how is education funded? And it's based on property taxes and who owns all of the homes. If you look at Hartford, there's very little home ownership. So therefore who is investing in education? New Britain, you all know is at the bottom in Connecticut and it just infuriates me. So when you look at public health, we have to look at how education is funded and the plight of our kids. This is our future. Where are we going with all of this? Right. Thanks, thanks so much. And, and, and actually, Mel, let me sort of bring you in with a, um, a question as well, um, you know, because we're quickly running out of time. And so I want to, I think we're a little bit behind schedule. So, you know, you, you talked a, a lot, you know, obviously there are housing challenges, right, that formerly incarcerated individuals, um, you know, face, especially finding access to affordable housing. Um, can you talk a little bit about that sort of challenge? And, and certainly, sure. you know, uh, Robbie can can jump in as well as we sort of talk about this. Go ahead. Sure. So, uh, you know, right off the bat, uh, a, a large majority of housing authorities actually uh, actively discriminate against people with a criminal record by not allowing them to access public housing programs. Um, but let, let me paint a picture of the community of people that are being released from our uh, Connecticut prisons. And it's important for everyone to understand that 95% of people, at least, who are in uh, Connecticut prisons are coming back home. But we have a, uh, a legal and regulatory structure that essentially makes them worse than second class citizens. There are more than 500 uh, legal barriers that formerly incarcerated people face that span the areas of housing, employment, certification, education. Those are the real barriers that people are stepping into in society when they leave Connecticut prison. So there's this uh, there's this phrase of you know you do the you do you you do a crime you do the time but really in Connecticut what we're talking about is you do the time and then you do the time and then you do the time and you do that for the entirety of your life. Uh, CTEH and uh, DOC uh, compared their data, a CC, uh, Connecticut uh, um, Coalition to End uh, Homelessness, and they found that between 2016 and 2020, uh, uh, 3,500 uh, people had entered the uh, shelter system that had a DOC number. So essentially what we're doing in terms of pol uh, criminal justice policy is that those 95% of people that are being released into, into Connecticut's communities were essentially saying, have at it, try your best. By the way, here are a bunch of barriers that are in your way. And we're essentially releasing people into homelessness. Setting aside the fact that many of the people that are kind of circulating through the Department of Corrections often are people that have high needs, be it mental health issues, health issues, and so forth. Um, but additionally, what I would add is what we often talk about are incarcerated people as individuals and not consider the fact that incarcerated people are part of families, that many of the people in Connecticut's prisons and jails are moms, uncles, fathers, uh, and children, uh, uh, and also that the impacts of the financial, the financial impact of incarceration, essentially uh, making a decision to put someone in a cage for X number of years, uh, essentially prevents a family from gaining any wealth. 
Um, and in fact, it sets that family behind. So when you ask what are the barriers, they're more than 500. They span uh, employment, housing, and so forth. There are uh, regulations that essentially ban formerly incarcerated people from reunifying with their families, like for example, local housing authorities. Um, and so what we're really talking about is Connecticut's approach to criminal justice is actually unsafe. Uh, because if we wanted to create safe communities, we would want to release people into a world in which they can thrive. And so I would encourage everyone to reach out to the Smart Justice Campaign in Connecticut. They're fighting for two bills that are incredibly important. The first is Senate, Senate Bill 1019. It's a clean slate bill. It's an automatic erasure bill so that once you, uh, when, after you've done your time and after a set number of years, your criminal record is immediately erased. Uh, erasing that criminal record will give people the freedom to get the types of employment and housing that they need. And also House Bill 6475, which tries to undo discrimination as a whole for anyone that has ever been arrested or has a conviction. Okay, so I'm I'm getting the the cue from uh, a vow that we are are, are actually out of time. So <laughs> so I'm being encouraged <laughs> to move you guys uh, along. So I'm going to invite Val back. Oh, I see. Jump back. He pop back up on my screen. You know, thank you so much. What a wonderful conversation. I know there are lots a lot more questions that will carry over into the small group discussion. And so I saw some jumping in the chat. So once again, thank you. I've learned a lot, and I may need to call on you for my class. So, you know, keep your phone available for me. <laughs> great, great. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, Bilal, for this outstanding panel. Melvin and Michelle and Robbie, thank you. Really, really fantastic. A lot of information to digest. Uh, we're going to break everyone into three small groups um, that you have been pre-assigned to by, by your own preference. Some of you uh, were not able to be assigned to to the group, to a particular group, so we'll be randomly putting you in a group, and you'll have a chance to actually ask questions of those panelists that you are going to be uh, speaking with in the small groups for the next 20 minutes or so, and there will be a facilitator uh, that will be sort of guiding the conversation and also taking notes to do a report out later, later today. So at this point, Zoya is going to break you into small groups. And we'll be uh, coming back together at um, uh, 155, 156. And then I'll be announcing uh, the break and, and the next uh, event, which will be the keynote speaker. So uh, enjoy the conversation in small groups. For Bill 6662, looking at the reduction of 70% of health disparities mm -hmm. and the creation of a statewide commission for racial equity in public health. And that, that's very important. Thank you, Michelle, because uh, obviously people who sit on those commissions, they include public health officials, but they also can include regular people who are uh, concerned. And of course, the appointing authorities, the governor and uh, you know, the legislative leaders do appoint some of the members of those commissions. But it's important that we have regular, quote unquote, people uh, also serving in that commission. And also for all of you as civic ambassadors to advocate in support of that piece of legislation. And so uh, we encourage you to do that. Uh, the next uh, small group, I think, uh, Eileen. Yep, you can go next. Um, so we had a lot of ideas flowing around in such a short amount of time, and I tried to record everything. Um, but a few topics that we touched upon was, um, basically my group talked about housing equity, and we talked about how tools like the Connecticut Zoning Atlas can help um, people visualize zoning codes, and it allows for people to think in a more critical way. Um, we also touched upon hearing from those that have actually experienced homelessness, homelessness themselves. So we can work to address these problems by learning from their experiences and apply, apply what we learned to taking the next step forward. Um, we talked about trying to educate as many people as we can on housing equity and kind of breaking it down to allow for more people to understand the harder concepts um, and possibly incorporating these topics in early education or implement these concepts into learning cur curriculums in middle school or high school. Um, and some challenges we included was that it's not really an approachable topic and it can be hard for some people to really understand it. And um, it becomes pretty unclear to how zoning may contribute to segregation as a whole. So 
um, if any of my group members want to add on to that, this was kind of what I got out of it. Um, but yeah. Okay, anyone else? Uh, so Eileen, thank you so much. By the way, Eileen is a student at, uh, at uh, UConn. And, yes. uh, and she's uh, involved in the campus dialogues. She was part of the campus dialogues on race program. She coordinated some great dialogues that address issues of racism. So thank you, Eileen. And the next group is Richard. Yes, hi. Um, and our group was focusing on criminal justice. So Mel was our, uh, our the panelist who is with our group. Thank you, Mel. And like everyone else, we had very, very short time and we could still be talking now and in well into the afternoon. But um, we first uh, had a little bit of general conversation and a couple of points came up was, uh, one was, um, the whether the disabilities community is being included and th their needs addressed in criminal justice reform. Uh, so we had some good conversation around that. Mel um, uh, agreed that that is an issue that needs to be worked on. Um, uh, another question that came up then was, uh, is work being done in high schools around uh, criminal justice reform, and uh, Mel shared with us his thought that, uh, as he did earlier with when we were in one big group, that um, it's really important to know how we got here and uh, where we came from, so that, yes, it is very important, and in fact, a lot of work is being done with um, students, high school and, and even younger, to uh, help them understand how we got here, because education is key. In order to be able to do anything about it, you need to understand the history. We then uh, briefly got into the question um, that the small groups were asked to focus on, which is what strategies have you found useful in engaging people in your efforts to dismantle, dismantle institutional racism? Again, in the context of criminal justice in particular. And um, Mel made the point that it's really important to work directly with the community and involve people with lived experience uh, um, because their, their input is critically important if any meaningful change is going to be accomplished and they carry a lot of credibility. Uh, people tend to listen to them, state legislators, others. Um, uh, so that's, that's a major point that he made with regard to what strategies work. And we then had um, a couple of our group members add um, that uh, using processes and structures that, that embody equity, uh, embody what we're talking about is really important. So that we're kind of walking the walk and talking the talk, so to speak, or is that the other way around? I don't know. Um, but anyhow, we were just getting warmed up and I know everybody had the same challenge, but um, that is pretty much what we covered. Uh, any of our group members, would you like to add anything? Did I leave out anything in particular? Okay, I think that's it then. Great, thank you, Richard. Uh, Eileen also, thank you, and uh, Lauren. And as you can, as you probably noticed, there's a lot of common threads in the discussions and that happen in the small groups and in the presentations by the panelists. And they all, the panelists all highlighted how interconnected these issues are. And they are in turn interconnected with other issues, you know, issues having to do with housing policy, impact, of course, health, impact education, impact criminal justice because of, you know, uh, excessive population density and so on. So we have to look at all these issues, not in isolation from each, from each other, but rather how they each impact each other and exacerbate the disparities and the outcomes for, especially for people of color in Connecticut. We are.